Amen. You can be seated. If you have a Bible, we're going to continue into Galatians, and we're going to be in Galatians chapter number three. So I want to invite you to go there and have your uh, copy of God's Word open so you can see uh, what we're looking at. It will be on the screen if you don't have it. You can also get on the YouVersion Bible app and all the notes are there. You can follow along and uh, do that. Or there's uh, physical notes in your worship guide uh, if you want to follow along. And uh, we want to uh, help equip you in that way. So definitely jump on and take advantage of those. But as we, as we get started, as we transition, I, w- I want you to think about something with me and uh, kind of get your mind into what Galatians chapter 3 is going to offer us. But literally every company you know, every single company that you have seen or bought something from or the brands that you're wearing right now, almost every company that you know, every product you buy every presidential candidate, whoever runs, has a brand, right? They have a brand. And with that brand comes a brand promise, something that they believe their brand will do for you if you will wear or buy or use their brand. And then further beyond the brand promise is what you and I interact with, their brand slogan, right? They're, they're there for everyone. So, so I brought a materialistic, consumeristic quiz for you today for you to feel really bad about yourself. I'm just kidding. I'm joking. But I do want you to see it because these are things we interact with all the time. So, so Andrew, put up that first one. It is this brand. Geico, you know, you know the lizard, don't you? You've seen the lizard, yes? Yes, you know the lizard. Does anybody know, you don't have to say this out loud, but what their slogan is? It's on every, he's like, uh-huh, and now it's in my head, thank you. All right, go to the next slide. It is 15 minutes or less can save you 15% or more on car insurance. We've heard that more than we would care who have heard it. Can I get an amen in the church today? But why do they do that so that you have it on recall immediately? Because the next time you need car insurance, who's the first one you're going to go to and get a quote? Geico. Or you're not going to because you're so annoyed by the lizard <laughs> and the commercial slogan. It may backfire. That's uh, understandable. The next one, a car product, BMW. Do you know what their slogan is? I'm okay with that. Too rich for your blood. (laughs) I love it. That's it. Somebody said it. The ultimate driving machine, right? You've heard it, I'm sure. Maybe that one's a little more obscure. Let's go to the more important ones. The next slide, please. Apple. (laughs) Do you know what their slogan is? We want to own your life. life. That's close. (laughs) That's close. (laughs) That's close, but not exactly. Here's what they say, and I didn't even know this. Here's what, here's what theirs is. Think different. Think different. Let's go to another one. Walmart. All right. Do you know this one? Walmart. Theirs is save money, live better. What a promise. <laughs> so many things I'd like to say, but I'm not going to. The next one. Here's a familiar one. Coca-Cola. All right, large brand worldwide. This this kind of <laughs> it's kind of blew me away. It's kind of blew me away. Here, here's here's what theirs is: to inspire moments of optimism and uplift. Think about that. If you will have a Coke today, you will have moments of optimism, and all of you will be uplifted as you drink your Coke. It's quite a promise. It's quite a promise. Until you read the calorie count and the sugar intake. (laughs) How about this one? Disney. Do you know this one? Do you know this one? Where what comes true? Dreams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where dreams come true. And where parents go to die. 
Just saying. Not that I'm speaking from experience. Kidding. One more. You'll know this one. Nike. Just, just do it, right? We know these things. We interact with these things. And even if you've never studied brands and brand promises and slogans and taglines, you actually do know a lot of these things because there are smart people behind the scenes organizing their brands to be sure that you connect with it, that you understand it, and that you know exactly why you should buy their product. And they're effective. And they're effective. It has me thinking, though, what about God? What about God? What about Christianity? What about following Jesus? Is there a brand promise Is there a slogan that would capture what it is that God has for you? I think there is. And Galatians chapter 3 is going to lay that out for us. But if I was going to say to you, this is the brand promise that God has for you, it would be this. And I want it on the screen for you. And I want you to write it down because I want you to accept it and think about it for you today. Here it is, that there is Jesus for you. That there is Jesus for you. Now, before you write me off, I know you know that. Or you probably wouldn't be sitting in here today. Fair enough. However, I want you to think through with me why the statement that there is Jesus for you is actually so critically important for your life, like right now. And this moment that we live in, as we look around the world and we see the unrest, it's important for us to ask the question, Why is this statement, there's Jesus for you, so critical? Why does it actually matter for you right now? But before we get to that, why is there's Jesus for you, his brand promise? Why? Why? Why that? Of all the things that are in this book and written in this book that are really important, why is that the one thing that if you could walk away with anything from the scriptures would be the most important? Because Jesus said It's why he came. The father said, this is why he came. So look at what a familiar verse to you is going to say. John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17 say this. For God so loved. For God so loved the world that he gave. Think about that. For God so loved the world that he gave. And he didn't just give, that he gave his only son. We could stop there and I would not be the perfect father for you. Because I don't know that I could give my son for you. I might give myself for you, but I don't know that I could give my son for you, as much as I love you. So think about the weight of what's being said. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever, and, and people have argued about the word whoever for a very long time, but you want to know what whoever means in Greek? Whoever. It's that simple. Whoever. And yes, I know what some of the other arguments are, but whoever believes in him should what? Not perish, but have a certain kind of life. It doesn't say a comfortable life here on this earth, does it? That's not what it says. What's it say? Lift up your voice and tell me that you would have what kind of life? Eternal. 
So immediately there's something different about the promise that God's making for your life because too many of us think that when we come to Jesus that our life will get easier and it's not going to. When you come to Jesus and he bids you to come and die and adopt into his family, he is for sure offering you an incredible life, but it is one for eternity, not for the now. Your life will almost assuredly get more difficult physically by following Jesus. As your life progresses over the next 10 years, it's going to get increasingly more difficult for you to believe what God says in this book and have a comfortable life. So we had better be sure that we understand what it means when, Je when Jesus is for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, and if you believe in something, it changes your actions, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And then verse 17 is just as important because so often we stop with 16. And we need to recognize 17 for what it is. For God did not. So with this brand promise of there's Jesus for you, there's an equal promise behind it to be sure that we know because of what we talked about last week. Do you remember? We as Christians over time are prone to move the power from Jesus over to us and say we actually have to do this thing. And then we start to judge other people, and then we start to keep score, and then we start to do all these other things, but that's not what the gospel promise is. For God did not send his son into the world to what? Condemn the world. That's already happening. And we're going to talk about why in a second. But God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The fundamental promise of Christianity, and you've heard me say this before, that is different from every other religion in the world is this. That when you realize that you cannot do this thing on your own and you begin to think, what happens to me when I die? So I cannot live on my own the way I hope to. I cannot die on my own the way that I hope to. I have a significant existential crisis. What do I do with that? When you come to be faced with that and you are offered the promises of our secular moment that are atheistic, in the past that are agnostic, in the past and the present and the future and will always be there, which is the religious, that in all of those promises, Jesus' promise, Jesus for you, breaks through all of those things and says the fundamental difference is that when you had that problem, as every other religion and offering came and said to you, Here's what you need to do to solve your problem. Jesus says, no, you can't solve your problem, so I will come and solve it for you. That is the difference of Christianity. And so this promise of Jesus for you matters. It matters big time. And when our culture decides that it's okay to oppress us physically like other cultures are around the world, you had better know what does it mean for me to have eternal life and why is that so significant? Jesus for you matters because life with Jesus isn't going to get any easier. In fact, it'll probably get more difficult. Critically important, but we need to ask the question then, and Jerome mentioned it earlier, that Jesus had to die. Why? Why did Jesus have to die? Why, why could we not just have snapped our magic wand and solved the problem? Why? It's a, great, it's a great thing for us to ask. Because at the risk of stating another thing that's more obvious than you need it to be, I want to anyway, I want you to think through this stuff because, you know, humanity, our world has not evolved into the awesomeness 
that maybe we're being told we are? How, how can we progress so far and then do some things that are so dumb? And I recognize that war is not dumb to the cultures that are doing it. But you and I, we can sit here and we can recognize like that's, that is not the way it's supposed to be. So where did this start? It goes all the way back. You know, this, this kind of evil versus good didn't start in the Middle East. It didn't start in Russia. It didn't start in these places that were seeing the evidence of it. It began in a garden that God created that was perfect. It began with Adam and Eve. And so we are sinners and we have been sinners since our first ancestors put foot on the earth after being created by Almighty God. And so the second thing I want you to write down, it'll be on the screen for you, is Adam and Eve needed Jesus. We can go all the way to the start and recognize that from the beginning, God did not create us as robots, but he gave us a decision in the matter. And Adam and Eve were swayed by Satan and that cosmic battle began. We don't, have, we don't have time to unpack all of it, but it is important for you to recognize that when I stand here in the 21st century United States of America and say to you, there's Jesus for you, that there are thousands and thousands of years that have progressively told the story that apart from Christ, you can do nothing. But here we are in 21st century United States of America and think we can do a whole lot. And then, boom, something like this happens, and we're, we're rattled, and we all of a sudden go, what do we do about that? You know, and then, and then you're faced with these questions, should we police the world? Should we not police the world? Should we send our folks in to help those folks? And these massive questions that are so hard and probably have 40 opinions in this room, if not more, 100. So we got to back up. And say, this has been going on since the beginning of time. Even Adam and Eve needed Jesus. See, because God made our first parents to be in relationship with him and to work the earth and cultivate it. And the setting was perfect. They had perfect conditions. And God said, there's, there's just one rule. There's just one thing because I'm holy and I'm perfect I, I need you to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And who knows if he was looking down the corridors of time, seeing Nazi Germany, seeing Russia, seeing all the things that we see now and saying, you don't want that. But in my goodness, I'm leaving that choice to you. But don't eat from that tree. And if you know the story, we aren't robots. We're made as humans in the image of God with great value. Adam and Eve chose to sin. And that cosmic rebellion and restoration, thankfully, was set in motion. We call it the fall or the fall of man. As a result of their choice to sin, this world is full of brokenness and we recognize that. And in case you're feeling bitter, (laughs) like, why am I suffering for them? I wouldn't have gone and eaten the apple. Yeah, right. (laughs) Romans 3.23, that'll be on the screen as well, says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You might have had two apples. (laughs) (laughs) I'd have been looking for a cow, right? Right? Maybe you wouldn't. Maybe, you, maybe you're a meat guy or a meat girl. But listen, what is amazing though is that when Adam and Eve sinned and then God showed up in the garden, he doesn't say you messed up and here's what you're going to do to fix it. That is not what he says to Adam and Eve, right? They're hiding and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm naked, right? And they're like, 
hiding and they, they're ashamed. And God says, no, 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 like come on out here into the light. And here's what he says to them. He doesn't tell them what they did wrong. He's honest with them. But he doesn't tell them how to fix it. He preaches good news to them. From the first moment of sin in the world, Jesus was preaching good news to his people. Look at what it says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Okay, so... There's going to be problems. In this world, you will have trouble. There's going to be issues now between people for the rest of time until Jesus comes back. But he transitions here to talk about the solution. It says, he, Satan, will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. The devil at this point has already defeated people. Are you tracking with that? From the first moment that Satan comes to Adam and Eve, we lost. Doing it on our own, doing it on your own, you're going to lose. You've already lost. We lost from try number one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And if you were honest with me and you look back over this week, maybe even this morning, you lost. We lose (laughs) constantly. Now listen, I'm not here to be all bad news, right? Because the story doesn't stop. And so the devil defeats them, but God doesn't come and say, you were bad, now you're good. No, he says, you have done evil and now you need Jesus. Right? You you were bad, but Jesus is good. So important. Have you ever blown it? You you ever had that moment where you're just like, gosh, I blew it. There was a moment when I was a kid that me and one of my neighbors took wiffle bats and went to another neighbor's house and beat one of their windows in. You know what I'm talking about? Like Big Bertha, we used to call it. The red wiffle bat, the big one. Right? And we just like, kids... So dumb. I was like, what were we doing? <laughs> like, you know, and so like, it's so dumb because you don't think about it until you're done, right? You got this bat, you're like, let's go beat the neighbor's window and you're beating this neighbor's window and you're like, I'm awesome, right? <laughs> and then it shatters and you're like, I'm not awesome, <laughs> right? And so like, I went and I hid and my parents couldn't find me for like hours. I was hiding and they were calling neighbors and searching. I was just in the garage. Come on, somebody. I didn't go too far. I didn't run too far. My parents just searching for me. How many of you think they were really concerned about the window at that moment? No. They, they were going to deal with the window. I was going to pay for my sin. There are natural consequences. But from the larger standpoint, they were worried about their child who had run away. Adam and Eve didn't think about it till it was done. So they hid and God comes to find them. And I just have to believe that God put you in this audience today. That God has you watching online today. Because there might be somebody who's running from God that you might be within the sound of my voice right now on purpose, God-ordained, divine meeting, because you are running from God. And I just want you to know that He, through His Word and through this meeting, is seeking you out. That you may be hiding, but He is searching for you. That he has, as the New Testament says, left the 99 and is coming after you. You see, because 
once Adam and Eve recognize that they need Jesus or we recognize that they need Jesus, we can just keep going in the Old Testament here. We can see next that, and this will be the next thing I want you to write down, is that Abraham and Sarah needed Jesus. You just keep going down the story because this is important because God establishes a covenant with his people through Abraham. This is the way that God begins to rectify the problem, that God begins in motion his kingdom coming on earth as it is in heaven. And in Genesis 17, 7, he says this, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for a what? An everlasting covenant. Critically important. Through an everlasting, right? Remember, what did, what did we start with? For God so loved the world, he sent his only son into the world so that all who believe in him would not perish but have what? Eternal life, everlasting life. Well, now we're, we're tracking back thousands of years and seeing where'd that promise come from? What showed up first to Adam and Eve and then it was ratified in a covenant to Abraham and Sarah for generations. And then what is that covenant? I love this. Why do we make that creature confession? You are God. I am not. Why do we do that? Look, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. You are a child of God in a long line of children of God who were confronted with the fact that they could not do anything apart from Jesus. Abraham and Sarah needed Jesus. Let's jump finally to Galatians. Galatians chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. This is, this is Paul talking to the Galatian people, and they are recognizing that there's a problem here. Paul's letting them know there's a problem. Remember, just the past few times, it's like, you foolish Galatians. And I steer from you too, pal. You idiot. <laughs> like, I know. But after all we talked about last week, he comes in verse 15 of chapter 3 and he says this, to give a human example, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. Here we go. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. The offspring that would come and fulfill the promise was Christ. Abraham, you need Jesus. What makes a covenant so special as opposed to just a regular old promise? Sally Lloyd-Jones in her children's storybook Bible says it best. I don't know if you've read that to your kids. If you haven't, you need to get one. If you don't have one or can't afford one, we have one and I would love for you to take it home. And you should read it for your devotions. Because it's awesome. Here's what she calls the covenant. I love this. It is God's never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. I love that. We need that, by the way. If you take inventory of your life and how many times you've run and come back, run and come back, run and come back, run and come back. Maybe you're right now running and he's offering you come back. Never ending, never breaking, always and forever kind of love. Critically important because, listen to me, listen to me. This is so important because how you see God and how you relate to God will eventually be how you relate to other people. Is the first thing you see in other people their problems? Or is the first thing you see in other people the image of God? Too often it's the problems. You can never outrun the Lord, thankfully. If you think you're great, never wrong, and without sin, you will struggle in your relationship to other people. So Adam and Eve, they needed Jesus. Abraham and Sarah needed Jesus. And we'll continue and see that even, next one to write down, Moses needed Jesus. Moses is a giant factor in this because it was like God introduced his covenant through Abraham. God's going to introduce his law through Moses. 
Back to Galatians here, and Paul will explain. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 17. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years after, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. So now there's this law, and you're looking at the law going, man, I don't, I am, I'm a problem. I can't do any of this stuff. But look at verse 18. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham with a promise. Why then the law? Why is the law in your life? Why do you need to know that you're such a bad person? Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions. Until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. Until Jesus would come. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Is then the law contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. If you could do it with the right set of rules, then we wouldn't need Jesus is what he's saying. Verse 22, but the scripture imprisoned everything under sin. So in other words, the law is there as a mirror so that you are fully aware of who you are apart from Christ. The law won't save you. Being a good person won't save you because you have a fundamental flaw. You are a sinner in need of a savior. Every one of us. So that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who, what? Believe. And so we're right back to where we started. What's the brand promise of the kingdom of God? There's Jesus for you. If you will just believe. And that brings us to our final point today. My final point today. I want you to write this down. You need Jesus. You see, because the the brand promise there's Jesus for you doesn't mean that you have Jesus, does it? You need to come full face to the fact that you need Jesus. Jesus. Look at how Paul finishes this out. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23 to 29. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law. Chances are, even if you're running from God today, you know there's a problem. You don't have it all figured out. You can't figure out how to find up and down and sideways. Where's the light? Imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came. In order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are, listen to this, no longer under a guardian. The law. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Why when we baptize people, why do we take communion? When we say that these are the places where God promises to participate with you. Because it's his act, it's him coming to earth, to you. What an amazing thing you've put on Christ. Verse 28 Why do we celebrate Black History Month? Listen to this. Because there's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free nor male nor female. You are all one in Jesus Christ. Wow. Look at verse 29. Somebody listening to me right now needs verse 29. Don't push it off. Don't set it aside. Don't intellectually block it. Feel it. Receive it. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring. (laughs) Heirs, according to what? 
a promise. You see, it's all connected. It's all connected. To what? A promise. (laughs) To what? A promise. The promise made to Adam and Eve. The promise made to Abraham and Sarah. The promise made to Moses. The promise made to the Galatian people is the same promise being made to you that if you are Christ's, how do I become Christ? The Bible says if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus raised from the dead, you will be saved. It's not a fairy tale. It's not far-fetched. It is the truth. And you can look anywhere in the world and see the brokenness of the law that is your guardian. Things are not as they are supposed to be. The mirror is up. Will you look? And will you confess? The Bible calls it repentance. Where you just simply see what God sees and you turn around and go a different direction. What is that direction? It's from you to Him. It's Jesus. There's Jesus for you. You need Jesus. So let me ask you the question. Even if you've prayed the sinner's prayer before, let me ask you the question. Are you running from God? Are you running from God? Whether it be consciously, like, yes, I'm mad and I'm running, or maybe it's unconscious. Maybe you are, by profession, like I said last week, a Christian. By confession, you're a Christian, but in your actual living, you have nothing to do with the kingdom of God coming on earth as it is in heaven. You are not seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You're building, in fact, your kingdom. Are you running from God? Can I invite you today to repent and turn to Jesus? Like, but, but, I, but I, no, no, no. If you feel it, it's the Holy Spirit talking to you. Don't push him away. It, it doesn't matter if you've prayed the sinner's prayer a hundred times or, or whatever, whatever your tradition thought. No, no, no. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you? Salvation is a posture of your heart. It's not a magical prayer. It's the confession of Jesus. It's the confessing of Jesus and the believing in your heart that Jesus is who he said he is, that he was raised from the dead, and that he is for you. You can be saved.